Thank you, Leo. I'm going to try to be hopefully brief, but those who know me, I'm really brief. But what I'm going to try to do is just make a few remarks, because I think the germination of the idea behind public private sym uh, symposium was to shed, if you like, uh, some rigorous scholarship and debate around the issue of public-private schooling. And what I'm hopefully going to do in the short time I've got is I'll talk about, I'll set the scene in the global context, but focus in mainly on the contemporary global shifts. I'll then talk about the rationales, forms and types of private schooling or private education more generally. And then I will uh, talk a bit about the private schooling context in South Africa trying to locate why today the debate are around private schooling or private education is more prominent than in the past. And then I'll end up with some questions because I think my task is pleasurable. I can raise the questions which I hand over to the panelists who are lots more experienced and have more grounded experience about the topic. And hopefully I'm not a victim of <laughs> uh, how to see. Um, now, I think let me just make a few introductory remarks. I think it would be fair to say that this, this debate has generated much more heat than light up until recently. And the reason it's generated so much heat rather than light is because this is about a very powerfully felt debate about the future of private schooling and public schooling for that matter. And it's about the breakdown at one level about those classified on the right and left of the political spectrum and those advocating a more pragmatic approach to the crisis of public school education globally. So for me, the debate about public private <coughs> schooling and private education is really at one level fundamentally rooted in different ideological propositions about what is desirable and what is the public good. If we just think of it internationally, in the UK, the debate about turning all schools, all public schools into academies, or the reintroduction or expansion of grammar schools, is about what the government ideologically believes is the value of public education and the role of the private sector in provision. Therefore, for me, a debate about private education <coughs> more generally, and for this symposium, private schooling is really about what we think about the public education system. And by giving you the example of the UK, it's to make the point that the solution uh, and debate and arguments and policy propositions are not just one, in, if you like, in the global south, it's also one about the global north. But let me make a few introductory remarks and I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Firstly, the changing nature of public sector provision and the role of the private sector does not occur in, a, in any society with tough changes to other social sectors and beyond, such as health or road infrastructure, as well as other levels of education. Although for those symposium, the focus is on schooling. Thus, the debate about the private in education is also more broadly the debate about the nature of society we'd like to see. Secondly, while we are understandably focused in the symposium on private education and schooling dimensions, we must not forget that private is more than just schooling. It cuts across textbook production, the testing market, monitoring and evaluation, and infrastructural provision in education. Take as an example testing. Anybody who's written the IELTS or the GRE or the GMAT or the SATS test in the US will know that that is one of the larger investments and in private sector involvement in education. Third, the idea of a full private, or for that matter, a full public is a myth. There are several ways, for example, the state intervenes in the public and vice versa. For example, and I'll show later in South Africa, South Africa provides subsidies to independent schools. In UK, 
schools that are classified as public schools are granted tax rebates or potentially uh, reduced charges on services if they classify themselves as charity status. And just as a last point, there are no VAT on school fees as a good. And in fact, the Labour Party's proposal in the UK, which I think is quite interesting, is to argue that there should be a levy and a VAT on all fees in private schools to fund school feeding schemes for all in public schools. And a further myth, as I discuss later, is that there is no single type of private, and I'll show that just now. But I could go on for a long time, but just in summary, the shift and the discussion of private, at one level, private education has historically always been around in education. But it takes a real form in the shift in the politics towards when the left-right grand narratives of the Cold War and the collective politics disappear in around the 1970s to which we move towards an individual-centered life politics focused on individual morality and individual needs and desires. This is in a shift, in a sense, a shift away from the hard Keynesian welfare politics and economics that took form in the post-World War II period in which the idea of social citizenship and rights were tied to and realized through the state. This shift occurs from that period onwards. And this political shift parallels the post fordist collective production shifts and social class to individual consumption and individual sense of self. These shifts were part of a growing spread of what some would arguably call neoliberal politics and policies that arguably began in the late 1970s. If you read the literature, the emergence of new forms of public provision can be dated to the oil crisis of the 1970s, when the strong belief in the welfare state begins to slowly erode. I'll skip some of those things that I was going to say, but one big shift is this, is that conceptually what occurs in this period the state, which was the main provider and took direct responsibility for social service provision, begins to withdraw. And one of the things it does, it makes a conceptual shift in delinking the responsibility for education from the provision of education. This fracturing and this break in about from the post-welfare period some argue post-welfare period is a significant one because the state as such was not also only withdrawing but also re redefining its control, giving rise to the idea of the state as a controller and not as a provider of output, ushering in the ideas of new public management theories and approaches. And it was paralleled by the World Bank then calling for a lighter touch to regulation and the loosening of provision. For those of you who are interested, there's an interesting paper about the extent to which the World Trade Organization and its general agreement on trades and services is advocating strongly for the opening up of social services to different forms of provisions. But I want to really talk about the contemporary global period, and I want to make two or three points. First, I think what we're seeing is what I call boundary crossing. Whereas previously, the relationship with the state in terms of the pub private sector was largely bounded and segmented as private and public operated on somewhat parallel tracks. In more recent times, as you will see here, there's a boundary crossing where the distinction between the public and private is blurred. The academy schools in the UK and the charter schools in the US are prime examples of the blurring of the public and private. But secondly, I think what's occurring in the contemporary period, why we're debating this, private schooling and its form has moved from the individual schools. The American literature call these mom and pop schools, individual private owners running schools, such as the CMS in India. To chains and networks of interconnected offerings which have maximizes and leverage the benefits of technology. In this shift, there has been the entrance of capital in its diverse form 
and in particular the entrance of technology companies and venture capital. The private education frontier is targeted not just as corporate social responsibility, but also as the next frontier of the private market in a post fordist neoliberal world where the body politics is individualized and in which individualized forms of consumption production as opposed to collective economic production. Take the example of breed schools. Every, it's always in the newspapers, but what we don't know enough about the breed schools is that it was founded by a technology startup hedge fund, right? And today it's backed by Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, testing giant Pearson, international organizations like DFID and international banks and financing institutions such as World Bank. They're all leveraging technology. Here's the direct website of the Spark schools in South Africa. I've highlighted a simple point here. Interestingly, what they point to is how they're leveraging technology as their unique selling point. Our model is the first of its kind for primary schooling students in South Africa. The software Spark scholars use is adaptive, allowing for highly individualized student practices and assessment. Notice also that they start at 7.45 a.m., and I can make a point about that later. So in that sense, the private sector and technology are significantly intertwined, and the entrance of private capital, but diversified private capital in the form of venture funds, hedge funds, philanthropic organization is significant, like the rocket ship education in the, U in the U.S. as well. In this sense, we see private schooling and private education more generally as the frontier of economic activity which brings together economic activity and social goods. Hence the rise of the ideals of social entrepreneurialism which besets much of the discourse of private education. Third, in this very contemporary shift, what we are witnessing is a coalition of forces and ideas manifest in a bricolage of policy ideas interconnected within and beyond nation states. Two slides that I'll say show, uh, this is the wrong, okay, this, let's say it much better. This gives you an idea of uh, the networks of capital. If you can read this in more detail, if you find ARC schools, you'll see it's connected to a whole network of think tanks, groups, capital firms, etc. This gives you the, an idea of learned capital which is behind breed schools, but Learn Capital also runs Class Dojo, Higher Art, Udemy, Block, and Bridge. So they're part of a larger, what you're seeing is the move from individual to chains to conglomerations of private schooling. I would talk a little bit about partnerships because the way the debate is framed is around theoretically the notion of partnerships, but I'm gonna skip that because I want to make the point that the changing forms of the state and public good provision in this context of this discussion is occurring in a global context where inequality rather than poverty per se has become the defining feature of political, social, and economic life. In the history of humankind and complexity and futurity, theorists point to this. The scale of inequality is not only unprecedented but the world is becoming more segmented and boundaries between the rich and the poor and the riches and poorest is widening by any conceivable measure. Poverty is a problem, but we need to recognize it as Tony says, it is the unacceptable face of inequality. Here's a nice quote from him. He says, when thoughtful rich people call a problem of uh, poverty, thoughtful poor people call what equal justice a problem of riches. Let me give you an example. The top 10 Ford's billionaires have together $505 billion. South Africa's GDP annually is $326.5 billion. Com compare that to even Norway. Norway's entire GDP is $395 billion. That's still much less than the top billionaires' 
the top 10 Ford's billionaires. You can look at it. Interesting, by the way, you need to read the data around Crad Swiss research and others. Action Aid says inequality has increased by eight points in South Africa since the 1990s, and that the top 1% of the global population controls over half of global wealth, while the poorer half of the world controls less than 1% of the world. Put another statistic, the combined wealth of the 200 richest people in the world is 10 times greater than the total wealth of Africa combined. So if you take Africa as a whole, con why does this matter? You should have asked. It matters because we're debating about the nature of future society and what we think about public sector provision. Uh, it matters because that we need to locate the debate in a discussion of what the world's looking like and the inequalities, but quality. Yet at the same time, private school is increasing and I'm not going to, I'll cut through a lot of the talk where I was going to talk more about the types of private schools because there isn't a single private school. There are different forms of ownerships, different orientations. If I just show you the slide, this is what a, a more nuanced understanding of private sub sector looks like, from a strictly public system to an integral element of the public education system. Now, there's several arguments for it, and I'm going to summarize them in slides now. These are the research that I've reviewed for this. And here's the bad news for both the opponents and proponents of private schools. So those who don't like private schools and those who want private schools, here's the bad news. When you measure it against quality, equity, accountability, the notion of the state, the simple answer is that the evidence is mixed and not clear cut as claimed by both proponents and opponents. For example, pupils attending private school do tend to do better than public schools. That's the reality. Not many studies are good enough to say that. However, most of the studies reviewed in this paper, not mine, somebody else's paper I'm quoting, says it's hard to account for social background factors. And while se several studies attempt to do so, many also recognize that it may be difficult to as ascertain where the achievement advantage can be fully ascribed to private schools. So again, it's hard to the social class determine. In terms of equity, it's fair to say that the evidence is at best ambiguous and in its most positive sense limited. We don't have enough studies of it. But in terms of equity, I'll come to equity just now, but the thing, most of the evidence is neutral, some is negative, but we haven't found in this research, this is a matter of research, positive evidence yet. This is mainly about low-fee private schools. Let me skip to the South African context. In the South African context, historically, there's been a big debate about private schools. Al already as far back as 1994, the ANC was debating about whether to include private schooling in its yellow book before 1994. Those who have a long history of it will notice there were two versions of the Yellow Book for governing release. One said we'd allow private schools to exist, and the, that was later withdrawn for typographical errors to say we'll, send a, we'll set up a commission of inquiry. Yet the Constitution resolves it, and Section 29.3 of the Constitution is fairly clear. Everyone has the right to establish and maintain at their own expense independent educational institutions as long as it don't discriminate on race, are registered, maintain standards, and it does not preclude state subsidies for educational institutions. So what model has South Africa taken in terms of the global scenario? I know I've caught a lot, but South Africa has taken a progressive steering of the private schooling sector, or independent schooling, and I'm using the words interchangeably. It's progressive steering, because, and some people would in even our go so far as to argue it might be pro-poor, in that it gives conditional grant system, it's conditional equity, social redress, and quality grants. It's conditional on the grounds that the state has oversight of such schools through the registration process and through funding. 
state curriculum, although this can be bypassed. The caveat here is not all private schools get state funding. It's, oh, it's about CDE estimates about 60% of private schools there. How big is the sector? And I'm just going to make a few points. I'll skip out on the corporate. In 2014, there were 25,741 schools, of which 6.5% were independent, a growth of about 110 from 2013. CDE, by contrast, estimates 2,500. So they thought there was 1,000, when in reality the increase was 100. If you think of the number of pupils as opposed to the number of schools, the public only talks about the number of schools. It's the number of pupils that's more significant. It's 4%, not 6% I in private schools. The number of teachers in independent schools are 8.1%. However, interestingly, the South African data does not give data for the number of school governing body posts which one could argue is a form of semi-private schooling. So in South Africa, it's not a big debate yet. So the question is, what is this future demand? Why are people talking about it? Because why is there limited demand? And I argue in this paper, we have a captured middle class, which still perceive flight from the public schooling as not a good option, despite the theory in 1997 at the inception of the South African Schools Act. But if perceptions of declining quality take hold and the fear of the other grows, then you might have an education flight in as much as you had an inner city residential flight. What does the private sector think about the growth? And I'm going to cut, okay, some of these slides are missing, right? So I'm going to have to read the slides again. Uh, let me read it out. Here's one example of what the private sector thinks about it, um, about the growth. OK, sorry, I just need to get the, the quote itself. I know I've got two minutes to wrap up, so I'm going to be relatively quick. This is it. Low-fee private schooling in South Africa is growing rapidly. Meanwhile, the public sector is shrinking. In poor communities where public schooling is described by the government as dysfunctional and worse by others, why shouldn't the private school sector emerge and grow? Which is a legitimate argument and something one needs to think about. But if you think about what the private sector, I googled and read through some of the valuation uh, statements of major companies and banks. EPSA in August 2015 argued that if you were an investor, individual investor, that now was the time to invest your shares into private schooling because they think there's a high expansion growth in the middle to low fee segment of the market. The high fee segment market is, they argue, is saturated, but there's high demand at the Middle East. This is what Esther said. While we were the market seemingly not entirely convinced about a company, it looks like a fantastic opportunity to buy in. The most obvious source of comfort is its exposure to one of the fastest growing markets. Private education targeting middle to upper income earners is still largely untapped. Demand doesn't appear to be a problem with many parents keen to pay a little more for the rightly priced education for the future. We think it shares, this is the company, provides an inexpensive entry into the high growth sector. So clearly what you're seeing, the phenomenon in South Africa today, is a shift away from where the private and public schooling were segmented to where, ex where the private sector is moving into the lower end of the market. And then there's the very advocacy by different groups about stimulating demand by deregulation, why they call the very visible hand of the market. So why are we so interested in private schooling and debating it now? One we're debating is the crisis of public education and loss of faith in the state to provide is real. Whether you measure it by performance, teacher accountability, crisis of human capital, fears of teacher union 
in influence or by any other dimension, there is without doubt an agreement that public schooling for the poor, in particular, is going through a sustained period of crisis. There is also the power of advocacy. There is a growing advocacy of the sector as evidenced by the following two quotes. But I'll skip those quotes. Third, I think I want to come back to where I started off, the global context. The global shift in thinking is clearly influencing the direction of education debate and is not disconnected with the changing pol political topography in South Africa. Look at this quote, and you'll all recognize it. I'm just going to read out. One of the most significant me uh, meetings of last week was a progressive re review of a new category of school. I'm not interested in that. This is the punchline. The model is based on the academy school pioneered in the United Kingdom under the Labour government in 2000. So clearly, Labour pushed the argument much more. This approach en enables public schools to be an operated in partnership with nonprofits and, and support. This is the new form of, uh, in that continuum I showed, where there's far more direct intervention into the public sector. When I visited some academy schools in London almost two years, I realized we had a lot to learn from them. In South Africa, we have some outstanding public schools, but not everybody can get into them, nor can everybody as yet jump into the middle income bracket of private school. What's the answer? The answer is to restructure the public education system. So I'm not going to, I'm going to skip all this and end off with so what and where to. These are the questions I think that struck me when I reviewed the literature and writing up this paper. So I want to end with a series of questions which I hope we can in this and coming symposia debate to shed more light rather than heat on what is an inherently contested policy move and context. Whether the emergence of different forms of private schooling does to the social functions of education. Are we seeing the marketization of the social as is happening in a global context catch above? Are we witnessing the individual forms of body politics and consumption pro production in the provision of public goods? Under what conditions of increasing private sector involvement is the state abdicating its responsibility, particularly the social rights of citizens? To what extent can the enlightened self-interest of the private sector work towards a common public good? How can the values of social cohesion and the moral compass of society be maintained in the context of increasing private sector involvement in its diverse forms? What are the durable and transparent forms of accountability and regulation that can serve to revitalize public education while harnessing the policy elements of a partnership? What is the unfolding research agenda to address these and many questions which will arise during the symposium? Sorry, I took a bit longer, but I tried to cut it as much. Thank you.